for everybody's time. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. Again, <clears throat> if you're just now joining us, and I apologize, I have like this kind of weird frog in my throat right now that doesn't seem to want to clear out. But <clears throat> I, um, I want this to be as discussion like as possible. I know that there's a lot of questions out there. I know that you've been bombarded with information with um, uh, policies and procedures and uh, things of all, all sorts, and you're trying to make sense of, of it all, and maybe more questions have formed than answers. Uh, I can certainly appreciate that, and we're doing our best to make sure that we can get those answers to you. Um, we're, we're working on that all the time. So if it's a policy question, um, I would ask that you go ahead and put that in the chat uh, that way, uh, several of us can, you know, kind of take a stab at it, because I'm joined here by some of our colleagues, uh, uh, Suzanne Tapp and Mitzi Ziegner. Um, and so um, I, I'd like to, to, to help ask for help from y'all, if you could, and kind of weighing in on some policy questions if they come up. And that way we can focus on <clears throat> trying to get y'all set up for uh, the, this flipped thing, whatever that is. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Ken Griffith. Um, I am the director of the STEM Teaching, Engagement, and Pedagogy program here in the TLPDC. <clears throat> I'm also a, an instructor in the Department of Biological Sciences, where I've been teaching distance courses for about six or seven years. So I have a little bit of experience <clears throat> in um, uh, building and deploying and executing a distance course. Now, we're not necessarily talking about a distance course today, but there are distance elements in a flipped course. So, excuse me, one minute. <clears throat> Very sorry. Normally they're cleared out. The cobwebs are cleared out by now. Um, so before we get too deep into this, I wanna define some terms. I know that y'all have been bombarded with a bunch of jargon and y'all are physicists and mathematicians and philosophers and you know y'all y'all are probably not familiar with a lot of the jargon that you've been hearing so let's let's unpack a little bit of the jargon so there's three teaching modalities there's face to face and i think we all know what that is mm -hmm. there's hybrid and then there's distance okay so all hybrid is is just that it's a hybrid of face to face and distance Okay, so we'll unpack that a little bit more if we need to. And then we have two new terms, which seem fairly self-explanatory, but I see them being used uh, interchangeably uh, with, with some of these other terms. So lots of conflation of, of these terms. So synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous is real time, right? You're, you're instructing in real time. Asynchronous, asynchronous is you are pre-recording content and when, when that content is being watched is asynchronous to when you have recorded it, if that makes sense. So to complicate matters further, <laughs> you, it's possible that you can mix these modalities and methods so that you can have a synchronous hybrid you can have an asynchronous hybrid, you can have synchronous distance, you can have asynchronous distance. And so I, I don't wanna get bogged down into, into those terms, but if you have some questions about that and, and need, a little, need that to be fleshed out a little bit more, we can try to do that uh, here in a few minutes. But I, I did wanna make sure that everybody's aware that these are all different things. Um, and, 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 and yes, they do overlap, um, but how they overlap is kind of critical. Now I'm going to throw a different term at you, which you probably know because that's why you're here. Then you have flipped, a flipped classroom or flipped education or flipped instruction. I have, I've had the great joy of uh, talking to several faculty over the last couple of days um, and certainly over the summer as well, but it's been highly concentrating the last couple of days. And what I have noticed in these conversations is that there is some confusion between what flipped is and what hybrid is. And so I want to kind of talk through some of that a little bit. So the basic, most simple definition of a flipped classroom is when you take content delivery and you put it online so that students can look at it in their own time and you take exercises, homework, um, anything that is 
you know, typically done uh, to, to uh, in form of application is done in the classroom. So let me, let me kind of continue this idea of unpacking hybrid. <clears throat> I have I have heard from many departments and many colleges uh, that that there are hybrid plans in place. When I ask the faculty member to explain to me what their plans are for a hybrid, I'm learning that hybrid means many many different things in many many different departments. So, um, if if we would like to talk about hybrid. Um, offline or in the chat or things like that, you know, we can certainly do that. But I'm, I'm going to kind of point us away from this idea of hybrid just for a little bit and focus on flipped. And, and I'll tell you why. I mentioned earlier that your mathematicians and your uh, uh, engineers and biologists and chemists and English folks and, and uh, humanities folks, um, that's your specialty. That's what you do. That's what you're trained in and that's your expertise. A hybrid classroom um, is going to require technology. It's going to require um, comfort with that technology. And it's going to require that you're doing technology and you're comfortable with that technology at the same time that you are teaching your content. That is a lot to ask of you. And so this idea of an asynchronous methodology or an asynchronous modality, such as a flipped classroom, might serve you better. I say might, and we're going to talk through that. So I will pause there and ask if there, uh, ask what questions you might have. Um, I do see that there was a question that came up here. Um, from Dr. Romano, I'm sorry, but does hybrid necessarily have a face-to-face -face component? Very good. Uh, yes, by definition, a hybrid does have a face-to-face -face component, but it also has a distance component as well. Does, gonna, does, go ahead. Does, does the flipped classroom then have to have a face-to-face -face component as well? Or can um, you use it, flipped uh, in, a, in a purely online uh, modality? It, it does. It, it does need to have a face-to-face -face component. <clears throat> um, there, are, there are ways that you could kind of hack that to make it more of a distance class. Um, but, but remember, we have, we have three primary modalities, and flipped is almost its own modality. So we have the face-to-face, the -face, we have the hybrid, and we have the distance. And then flipped is almost its own mod modality, but it's not formalized per se. Um, and so, yes, it is possible. Okay, great. Um, there's, there's some, uh, Suzanne just put in a link here for some definitions and, and things of that nature with resources, et cetera, to help kind of flesh some of that out. But, but I did, did I kind of touch on your, did I answer your question in brief? Uh, yes, you did. I mean, I'm going to be teaching my class on online, uh, this fall, okay. but I was interested in the flipped sort of uh, instruction mode where things that would normally be done at home would be done in the classroom, which I thought could possibly be done in a synchronous way uh, remotely. It, it can, um, and we can, I can talk very briefly about that. Uh, Zoom is an excellent way of doing that. So for instance, if, uh, so we're on Zoom now and Zoom has the capability of having breakouts. And if you've not had an opportunity to uh, see a, a, a workshop that was conducted by my colleague and she's gonna have a, a few of those uh, this term, uh, uh, Erica uh, Brooks Hurst, she kind of breaks down breakouts and, and how to do it. And so one way that you can uh, kind of have a flipped type model is you can provide instruction at a, in a distance modality in Zoom and then break students out into discussion or into problem solving sessions and things of that nature, which feels kind of flipped. But that's not technically flipped, right? Because that really resembles just good distance teaching is really what that is. Because oftentimes distance instruction uh, is thought of both by students and some faculty as a correspondence course. 
And that's what we're, and we're trying not to make distance education the correspondence course. We're trying to have some active engagement where, where the faculty member and the students are actually working, they're answering questions, they're solving problems, they're engaged. So what you're describing is really just a good practice for a distance course. And, and I, I, I would hesitate to going so far as calling that flipped. Flipped by definition, again, is that there's a distance component where they're watching content, i.e. lecture, um, and then in class, there's a physical face-to-face -face, um, uh, exchange of ideas, information, problem solving, so on and so forth. And so my, my recommendation, in fact, our, our the recommendation, of, recommendation of many of us in the TLPDC is that instead of trying to go with a hybrid modality that's going to require you to, to, to essentially be an expert in technology and in your field of study, um, a flipped modality might save you some time and heartache, <laughs> if, if that makes any sense. So um, I want to go ahead and see if there's other questions about some of the things that I just talked about, and then we'll move forward. Yeah, I have a quick question. So is the flipped class a subset of hybrid class? So what's the, what's the difference between the hybrid and the flipped class? That's a good question. Uh, you could say that a flipped class is a hybrid class. It, it, it is a type of hybrid class, yes, because it has both a distance component and a face-to-face -face component. Um, so very briefly, I guess when I brought up the, the various modalities and the vernacular, um, I, I was afraid that what could happen is that we get stuck or bogged down into defining those specifically with how your department is defining those. Um, so so I'll, I'll just briefly explain what the differences could be with this idea of hybrid. So for instance, I know that the College of Engineering is doing hybrids in a way that um, a percentage of students, we'll just say a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, for example. Um, on Monday, uh, group A, 30% of the class comes to class and groups B and C, the other 60% are watching online in real time, right? That's a true hybrid, right? Um, and then on Wednesday, group B comes and then A and C are watching. And then on Friday, group C comes and group A and B are watching online, right? That's a lot to keep up with just right there, right? And so that's, that's the general plan for the hybrid model. But, but here's the, the things that, that we need to think about. We need to think about what technology you have in the room. Do you have cameras? Do you have microphones? Do you know how to run those cameras and microphones? Are the cameras pointed at you? Are the cameras pointed at the whiteboard? Are the cameras pointed at the audience? Are the cameras pointed at your document camera? There's, this is a full production. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm cautioning you uh, that if you're, if you're thinking that hybrid is the way to go, you need to have started yesterday um, in making that work in visiting the room and checking to see what technology you have. Because here's, and, and I just wanna be completely transparent here. Um, the Raider rooms on campus are outfitted quite well with technology for, for audio and video cameras, um, computers, et cetera. But every room on campus is not a Raider room and Raider rooms are maintained and, and uh, inventoried by operations, by the operations division. Anything that's not a Raider room is maintained by the department that that room is in. And so you may not be in a Raider room, which means that the technology that you have is what's already in that room or what may be coming to that room, but we don't know what's coming yet. And so that's why I urge you to uh, immediately reach out to, um, uh, well, go visit the room, find out what's in there. And if what you think should be in there isn't, you might reach out to that department. I was, I was talking with uh, a, a step uh, fellow yesterday um, and he's, a, phys a, a physicist, and then he is teaching over in agricultural education. And he's, he, he's still, he's going to go find out today what's in his room. And his current plan is to do a hybrid. And I said, okay, that's great. You need to visit that room as soon as possible. 
And then his next question was, was, well, who is responsible for putting the equipment in that room? And I said, that's an excellent question. Um, it's, it's not operations because it's ag ed, right? And it's not physics because the, the, the classroom is ag ed. And so if the, if the room is not outfitted in the way that you need it to be outfitted, you need to have a conversation with the department chair of agricultural education and find out what the plans are for that room, if anything new is coming in. And then it's a matter of negotiation between you and that, and that department chair. So there's a lot of moving parts here with, with the idea of a hybrid classroom. So let's go ahead and, and move forward um, and talk, talk flipped, okay? So there's some questions that, that you should consider. First of all, how big is your class? Um, are you, is it, do you have 25 students in class? Are you teaching an honor section? Do you have 50? Or do you have 200, 400, who knows? Um, that's something to think about because if you're, if you're, you've got a class of say 25, um, trying to go hybrid or distance or, you know, some, something that might be fairly easy to navigate. Anything over 50, I am strongly recommending an asynchronous content delivery, um, especially if you get to into the, the triple digits. Um, so let me, let me ask you this. Um, have you thought about how long your videos might be? So for instance, if you're, if you're doing any sort of a, a distance or if you're doing a flipped, uh, you're gonna have to pre-record some videos, right? And so something to think about is how long the videos should be. Our, our first reaction may be, well, it's a 50 minute class, so the video should be 50 minutes long, right? Wrong. Uh, what, what we see in the literature is that um, that is actually recommended against. Um, and there's some debate as to what the ideal amount of time is for a, uh, a, a little segment of video. Some, uh, some folks say 20 minutes, some folks say 10 minutes. Um, I tend to average the two and go with 15, you're probably safe. If it, if it goes over 15, it's not a problem. Just, you know, just try and keep them as close to 15 as possible. There's a lot of reasons for that. And, and we, can, we can talk about those here in a minute, but I wanna make sure that we kind of keep going forward with this idea of, of a flipped classroom in, in, in general, and then we'll get to the nitty gritty. Um, what, uh, what you may be thinking now is, okay, well, if I do videos, then I have to caption those videos, right? So I know that a lot of folks are hesitant to do any sort of pre-recording of anything because they don't want to have to caption. So I, I want to clarify a couple of things, and um, I'd love it if Suzanne or Mitzi or anybody would like to weigh in here, um, but I, I want to let you know that, yes, you will need to caption uh, pre-recorded videos. Uh, but I also want to let you know that if you're any sort of video that you're offering in class needs to be captioned too legally. And so just, just because you're doing something in class does not relieve you of responsibility for uh, being compliant with ADA. And so um, it, it's not necessarily getting out of anything. <laughs> if, you're, if you don't want to do a flipped classroom and you don't want to pre-record anything because you have to caption, sorry, bad news. Um, we need to make sure that we're, we're uh, maintaining best practices and, and being compliant with federal law um, and, and captioning any sort of video or any sort of uh, uh, audio or video capture that's happening in class. Um, now, I know that um, that, that is, is seems daunting, but I do know that right now, um, during COVID, during uh, all, of, all of this situation, there is some, and, and this is where I might ask Suzanne to kind of weigh in, uh, there is a component that if there's not a student that requires a, a ADA um, uh, accommodations for pre-recorded captioning, things of that nature, I think that um, there is some relief there. Uh, for right now, um, but um, I know that, um, oh great, Suzanne just uh, added a link to, um, uh, to e-learning where, where they talk specifically about captioning. Uh, and I think um, the, the, the thinking is as well, if, if, there's, if there's no student that needs it in the classroom, do I need to provide it? And so that's a fair question. Uh, the, the strict 
letter of the law answer is yes, you still do. But um, I know that there is some flex on that, or at least uh, there has been some flex on that. Um, and I would urge you to check out that link that Suzanne just put into the chat window uh, on, on that topic. Well, Ken, I'll weigh in um, since you asked um, and say that um, he, Ken is absolutely right. We are in, um, we are not in a remote online situation anymore. We're in online teaching and there is a difference. Um, last spring, we had more flexibility, if you will, and um, grace about captioning our videos because we were all pivoting and doing this big switch to, ah, you know, to, to online learning. If you are um, providing uh, recorded materials for your students in the fall semester, they should be captioned, period. Um, th that, that is according to ADA accommodation and that is universal design, that is what we are expected to do. So we've put these links to the captioning lab um, in the chat, and, and that is the advice that we really are obligated to give you. Um, now, I do wanna say that, um, as Ken has suggested, if you have a class where you have no requests for accommodation, this is where it gets um, a little bit gray, if you will, you need to be captioning those. But if you have a little bit of lag time, I think that there is some leniency there. You should do it. We wanna recommend that you do it. Um, prioritize this if you have students who have requested accommodation. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, and- I have a quick- in, in the chat, someone's asked about class recordings in Zoom. If you record your class in Zoom and you provide that recording as a resource to your students, it should be captioned so that all students have equitable access to the recording. So I have a question when we talk about captioning, what are we talking about? So when you do a video, doesn't the video, uh, uh, like the person speaking, you, have, you can hear the person's voice and you can see the person. Uh, speaking so we talk about captioning i'm not sure what how that uh, how that's driven from like making a video where you can see the person and hear the person's voice so captioning would be um a transcription of the uh speech in the video so that there are words on the captioning going across the video that transcribe speech to text oh okay i think that makes a lot of sense thank you sure and I can go ahead and uh, thank you, Suzanne, for, for clarifying uh, that. Um, so since we're on that topic, let me ease your minds a little bit about this process. Um, so the, um, the, the, essentially the process to getting your videos online requires you to record them, right? That's fairly obvious. And then uh, you need to post them somewhere. Now, I want to, to add some caution here. Uh, I think most people think that you post them on Blackboard. Well, um, we ask that you don't, and Blackboard administration certainly asks that you don't. Um, there was the great Blackboard crash of 2015 or whatever it was where <laughs> we don't want to go back there. Um, and that was because um, there was a particular Blackboard page that was overloaded and it resulted in the whole thing coming down. So um, at that time, Texas Tech purchased a whole lot of server space on something called MediaSite. And MediaSite is our university media server. Uh, MediaSite is, the, is the, the trade name. And the person who um, can help you with MediaSite, his name is Joel Martin, J-O-E-L. Uh, actually, I'll just go ahead and type it in here. So joel.martin at ttu.edu. Joel Martin is, uh, he's the media site coordinator for the university. And simply all I need to do is say, hey, Joel, um, I'm thinking about putting some videos online. Can you help me? And he knows exactly what to do at that point. And so essentially, let's say you're teaching Zoology 2404, you will now have a channel on media site that is titled Zoology 2404. And then you will upload your video files to that. Now, some of the reasons why I said um, a video file is 10 or 15, or uh, your video should be 10 or 15 minutes, here's, here's a couple of reasons why. So 
trying to um, render and upload an hour and 20 minute video um, could be frustrating. It depends on your Wi-Fi connection, your broadband, how much bandwidth you have, if you're sharing that uh, bandwidth. And so just simple logistics, um, a 15 minute video is gonna be a lot easier to upload than an hour and 20 minute video. So aside from pedagogy, it's just logistically easier. Um, so, so Joel Martin will help you get set with that. Now, what about this captioning stuff, right? So are, are you gonna have to go in and, and caption your own videos? Fortunately, we have resources for you. Um, at that, uh, one of the links that Suzanne provided in the chat window, um, you can actually uh, request captioning from e-learning and academic partnerships, and um, they will go to your media site channel and access your videos there. You don't need to gather them in emails and share them on OneDrive or Dropbox or whatever. Uh, they will actually go to your media site channel and access your videos there. Um, in fact, uh, I, I just recently updated some of my videos and I had, had them uh, recaptioned and it was, it was like magic fairy dust. I, uh, it was awesome. I, I, I sent in my request and at the time, and I'll get to that here in a moment, I think Reagan may have mentioned something. At the time, it was three days. Three days later, I said, poof, I had words on my videos. It was fantastic. I know that obviously they're getting a little bit backlogged. So um, I think that they're somewhere around seven to 10 days now. Um, I would recommend, there's, there's two ways to, to really do that. Um, you can record all your videos, put them on media site with the help of Joel, um, and then notify e-learning and say, hey, I've got 100 videos that I need captioned. When they see 100 videos, they're going to say, oh, wow, okay, that's going to take, you know, better part of a month to get that done, right? So what I recommend is that after you record one, you notify them and let them know that it's ready to be captioned. Now, you can have an, an open conversation. So the person you'll be working with is Terry Yoakum. Um, and uh, she is awesome. She will contact you and say, hey, I got your request. Um, what are the titles of your videos? Do you have a titling convention? You know, I, I see them here in media side. I just want to make sure that I'm, I, we're going to caption the ones that you need. Um, and then you can say, okay, so I've put a whole, I put a hundred a semester's worth of videos there and I need them all captioned as soon as you can and she'll say well we'll talk to you next month or you can say um so how best can I get these done in a hurry if if I if I notify you after every two or three that I've done or after every one that I've done and you can negotiate with Terry and her team and and find out how best to to do that so it's fantastic it works really well it's 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 you don't need to be a middle middle person um, if, uh, if in terms of getting sending files, sending and receiving files, it just kind of happens. If you follow the procedures, contacting Joel Martin first, and then uh, clicking to request captioning services at e-learning uh, and academic partnerships. So I'll pause there and open for questions about anything I just mentioned. Do you mind if I share my experience? Please, Reagan. So I, um had my computer t person. So I reached out to him because I recorded videos before, but I wanted to know how it works if you're recording from Zoom, because before you, we had a classroom in the math building and you would record in the classroom and it worked magically. So as Ken said, I contacted my computer person and Joel and they made it all, the folder was available, it was a shared folder and they made it available to whoever needed to be. So I just recorded my videos in Zoom, just sitting at my computer and I sent them seven at a time. So on that link that Suzanne posted, that file attachment, you have to fill out that form because it gives them all the URLs. And I just sent them seven at a time and they'd say, we'll get it back in seven days. And I sent them 30 videos over the course of a month and it was done. It was really, and I got the SRT files as well. So it's not hard, it's Ken told you the process, I didn't, well, I didn't know this in June, so it took me a little longer to figure out what the process was to know who to contact. But I had some idea because I recorded videos before using MediaSite. And Joel, I, I have Joel's number, is one of my favorites. I just call, he's like, hi, Dr. Higginson, like, I need to know this quick little thing. And he tells me, and it's because I just, it's different not being in that room where all the, you just push a button and it magically goes to the right place. But it really, um, 
it works great. It's, it hasn't been a problem. And they've been, when I got my emails, they said, we'll get them to you in seven days and seven business days. And I got them all in seven business days. So it's great. Thank you, Ray. I have a quick, quick question here. And that is, so for, for me at this point, and it's not really flipped, so I'm sorry if it's kind of, it's a little out of topic, um, but it fits to the, to the captioning. And that is, so mm -hmm. I, I record my, my classes uh, as I'm talking on Zoom. And then I post those and I try to post them as, as soon as possible after the class ends because that's when students have questions. And so now, um, do I wait until I get the version that has a subtitle or has captions in it? Or do I post my initial version on like, you know, on media site and then, then from there to Blackboard? And then that updates like whenever they put their caption on it. And I basically, once I posted the original, I, I walk away and and you know let the thing work itself out just my, my concern is if i have to wait a week if i wait two days students over the summer and last spring we're already like well we had some questions we really like to watch your videos before we can do our homework right I, ideally in a perfect world you would have them captioned before they're deployed but um i, re I don't recommend that you wait for that process um, go ahead, post the videos. That way the students have access to them. They can start working on the material and then you can be actively working on the captioning at the same time. And, and as they're captioned, you, you, won't, you and your students won't notice any difference in how to access the files and what the files look like and so on and so forth. So um, odds are that the, the students may not need captioning in your particular class. There may not be a student that ha that requires that accommodation, but that again, we're not, we're, we need to do it anyway, legally, but, but we certainly don't want to hold the content hostage, um, you know, so that they can't get access to it. So does that help? Uh, yes, it helps. Um, maybe just a quick follow up um, do, and you may not, may not know this, but um, does e-learning put like basically edit the video that's, that's linked or do they you know send a new video and uh, i have to like change the link you won't know any difference uh, they they, right. they basically they put it right back in the exact same spot and so when when you when you're mentioning links that that brings me to this point of how these students are accessing this video you can actually and, and you know this because i heard you just say it you can actually link from blackboard to the media site video right and so really all you're doing is you're linking to that file. And so that file is what has been modified with the captioning. And so you don't, nothing has changed. The titles are the same. It's not a new file extension. Literally the link is taking it, taking it to the right place. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. Awesome, thank you. All right, let's, let's move on. I wanna go ahead and share my screen uh let me get down here and do this all right so you should see on your screen uh something that is and i i apologize it's orange and it looks like it's coming from the university of texas because it is can you see that i know i know at least it's not coming from a m oh wait i didn't say that it's a joke all right, so let's, let's kind of look at this for a moment. We're going to focus here on the left side. This is a very dense document. So we're going to focus on the left side, and I'm going to walk through getting a flipped class going, okay? And I really like this resource. Um, so you may not want to flip your entire class. This may be too daunting of a challenge. So you can do a modified flip or a semi flip, right? These aren't official terms. These are, you know, so the way you start that is you determine which topics need to be flipped. Let me, let me just offer a suggestion. You are probably keenly aware at this point that there are certain parts of your course material that are more difficult than others, right? What if you flipped those components? What if you took the most difficult component of your class and you flipped it? Because here's the beauty is that once it's flipped and you have a pre-recorded video of it, the students can watch that video a hundred times if they want. They can slow you down. Literally, my students have told me that they love to slow me down and speed me up. Um, and they love to tell me how I sound when I'm slowed down and sped up. Um, so they can, they can make you as slow or as fast as they want in their players. 
They can repeat those as many times as they want. And then you have the ability to follow up with them about those videos in, face, in a face-to-face -face modality. So again, we're talking about a flip here. So you put the really hard stuff on, um, online, they can watch it ahead of time because you know we all want students to read the book, right? Before they come to class, right? That doesn't always happen. Um, they're far more likely to watch a video though. And I'll give you some tips on how to make sure that that happens. Um, but they're gonna watch the video, they're gonna come to class and they will have been exposed to this content, but they don't quite know how to apply it yet. That's the beauty of the, of the flip modality. Then you have the ability to move them up. If you've, if you've ever heard of Bloom's taxonomy, right? Um, it's basically a taxonomic model that, that, you know, a lot of times it will be, if you Googled it right now while we're having our conversation, you'll see it in a pyramid, in a table, in a sphere, in a circle. It's, I've seen it a thousand different ways. I think of it in a pyramid. You've got the, the biggest base is basic comprehension or just basic understanding, rote memory, if you will. And then the very tip of the, of the pyramid is synthesis. It's, this, is, this is like senior level, graduate level kind of thinking, right? So if you're, if you're teaching a chemistry class, uh, the basics down here is gonna be, you know, how you, um, how you identify the weight of an atom or how you identify, how do you read the, the, the periodic table? And then synthesis is where you start designing experiments or, or thought questions or uh, um, critical thinking questions about how you utilize that. Then you start thinking about the way the, the periodic table is arranged is very intentional. It's not just random things sorted out on a table, right? So you have the ability to do that in a follow-up conversation. So it's really helpful and, and students like that ability. You also, and I, I wanna mention this just because it's important, you also have the ability to briefly, briefly review some of the things that were mentioned in that pre-recorded video. Why do I stress the word briefly? A flipped classroom should not be used as a way to double dip lecture. Um, I, I've seen a lot of faculty kind of abuse the idea of a flipped classroom. They're like, sweet, I can give them chapter one on video and then I can cover chapter two in class. And they, and you know, we slam through the material. That's not the intent of a flipped classroom. It, yeah, sure, you can briefly go in and say, okay, there may have been a, something in the video that you were confused about, or a student may say, hey, there's like the middle of the video, I don't understand what you're talking about. You can cover that. I strongly encourage you to do that, but please don't use the in-class time to, to double up on information that's, that's transferred, right? So, so that's kind of step one is where do you start? What topics within your course have you noticed that students are struggling with? Where are the pitfalls likely to occur? Also with misconceptions. I know physics is, is, a, is a, a, a course, is a, is a discipline riddled with misconceptions, right? Students wanna know if this is stopping at the top of the arc. That's an opportunity for you to explore that, to, to, to define whether that's happening or not. So the next box here, if you can see my cursor, UT instructors are, are using, we can replace that with Texas Tech instructors. Um, so what do you use in class, right? So homework problems, you can certainly use that in class. You can use response systems or polling systems. So for instance, if, you're, um, if you have a class of up to 40, you can actually use a completely free polling system called Poll Everywhere. And you literally can just jump online and poll your class. If you have um, larger classes, um, it's very likely that the textbook that you're using has um, uh, uh, resources as part of that textbook. For instance, Pearson, I know that Pearson and McGraw-Hill both have built-in polling into a lot of their textbook uh, resources. So you might inquire uh, with your publisher about that. Um, and then there's some other ones that, you know, we could talk about in a, in a separate conversation, but, or, or you can reach out in, uh, in email, uh, but, but you can poll your class. Um, it, and it's, it's worked really well. Um, now, some of the other things that you can do, because, uh, you know, many of you may be thinking, okay, well, I've got the videos, but what do we do in class? You know, do we just sit there and stare at one another? Hopefully not. Uh, and hopefully you're not going to just repeat what you repeated on the video, because then you've, you've undone the value of a, of a flipped class. But let's say you're teaching physics. Demonstrations. Normally, we don't have time for demonstrations in, in a class. 
um, because we're worried about delivering content and students are worried about copying your content down word for word. But if they've already been exposed to that ahead of time, then you can use class time to, to pr provide a demonstration of what that looks like, of what projectile motion looks like, of, of how a lens works, right? What focal length and focal distance and all those things. That's stuff that we don't have the ability to often do in class. This gives you that chance to be able to do that. Um, simulations. So for perhaps you have an online resource. Um, uh, we had a former colleague uh, named Robert Moorhead uh, who was in physics who had really cool simulations um, in his astronomy class. Uh, and he showed those in class because he basically had a flipped classroom. And the students loved it. They, they weighed in in their evaluations. They're like, I love the fact that he's got time to do simulations and so on and so forth. So again, simulations, demonstrations. Now, how do we make sure they're watching the video? I'm glad you asked. So um, formative assessment is really important in any classroom, right? So I'll briefly define formative assessment. There's, there's two types of assessment. There's formative and there's summative. Summative assessment is what we're kind of used to as a traditional method, what we all probably went through coming through school, right? It's where you go and you watch class uh, of fire hose material coming at you. And in three weeks, you have a giant test that's worth 30% of your grade. That's summative assessment. And that's how we typically tend to teach. Formative assessment is where we're literally assessing the students frequently, high frequency, and it gives both us and more importantly, them the ability to see how they're doing. Did they understand the concepts that you just spent the last 10 minutes talking about? Because if you, so for instance, if you're using some sort of polling software to formatively assess what's going on, you can, you can ask them in a polling software or on a quiz, that's, that's where I'm going next, about the material that was that recorded that they're supposed to come to class having watched. You can ask them, and if you see a rainbow of fruit flavors and bars that are all different size, sizes, and you've got A, B, C, D, and you don't see a, a definitive A answer, that means A, they didn't watch the video, or B, they didn't understand the video. That gives you a place to, the for, this is the formative part, this gives you a place to start that discussion, right? So, did okay, so, all right guys, are you like bombing this quiz because you didn't watch the videos? Or are you bombing this quiz because you don't actually understand this? So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go ahead and pull you again, but before I do that, I want you to turn to your neighbor and talk about it for a second and see if y'all can come to a consensus. Now, neighbor is gonna be a little different these days, right? Because your neighbor is probably six feet away from you. Um, you're gonna have to kind of figure that out and work that out in your class. Um, that's that we can, we can have a conversation about that offline. Uh, but that's kind of a, a bigger conversation that I don't really want to go down uh, deep into. But my point is, is that you can still have conversations wearing a mask six feet away. We've been doing it for four months. We can figure this out. Let's go. So, um, so the quiz idea, that's a way that you can formatively assess whether they watch the video. It's also a way that the students can formatively assess where they admit that they didn't watch the video. And the beauty of formative assessment is that it's not going to break their grade if they do poorly on one. It, they're low stakes. So remember I said summative assessment, you got this 30% test, you bomb that, you, you're working your way out of a C, right? So formative assessment, they're, you know, they're basically participation points. You know, it may be worth 10 points out of a thousand point class every time they take one. They're, they're not gonna make or break their grade, but they can hurt if they continually perform poorly on them. So the idea is, is that they might bomb the first one, but then they realize, okay, I guess I need to watch these videos because then I can do well on these formative quizzes. And then they start doing well on the formative quizzes. And then, there were, then we're getting what we want. We're getting students that are coming to class prepared, right? So evidence-based practices. Now, I, I touched on this, and now UT is recommending three to five minute video segments lasting three to five minutes. That is, um, this is when they're recommending a specific topic. So if you have a specific topic that, you know, is, is a, you see is constant pitfalls, and I'll just, 
I'll say one from my course. Uh, students often confuse this idea of hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. And so I have to spend a few minutes making sure that they understand that. That takes five minutes to make that, that explanation. If you're trying to do an entire class, obviously you're not gonna cram 30 slides into five minutes. So that goes back to our recommendation of say the 15 to 20 minute mark. So, so I'm gonna you know, kind of add a caveat to this one here. But evidence-based practices, what, what that is, is, that's basically presenting material that we know that the presentation of that material works because research has been done on that, on that process. And so if you look briefly at some of the, uh, the, the other content that is on here, the students talk, you know, ad nauseum about how, how it's changed the way they think and they work on campus. And I'll, I'll, um, I'm going to point you to a couple of papers here in a second because I know that, you know, we love our papers, right? But um, there, are, there are several faculty on campus that are using, that have been using the flip modality for ages. So uh, Dom Casadante in uh, chemistry, Nathan Colley in biology, Reagan, I think you said, so you're, are you doing a flipped modality now? Or moving towards that? I'm gonna move towards that. Okay. I've done before, kind of in my face, even when I had face-to-face -face classes, I had some videos that were already prepared. So I would say, this is up in advance, so you feel free to look at it, but it wasn't necessarily a requirement. So now I'm going to right. require it and see how it goes. Okay. All right. Michael Dini in biology, he's done, uh, he's done a full flip. So this is, this is not new. Um, and I guess I should, should verify that. These, um, the, the, the hybrid class, this is not new. This is not invented just because of COVID. We've been doing hybrid classes for ages and there's tons of papers on it that say that it's effective. Um, flip classroom is not new, not by a long stretch. It actually originated in K through 12. Uh, a couple of chemistry teachers in Colorado, they started the whole idea of flipping. Um, and so um, this isn't uncharted territory. We know that this works and, and so I, I want to go ahead and just point you to, to further convince you to a couple of studies uh, where we see that it works um, or, or we see how what effect it has on, on our classes. So this just happens to be from UNC Chapel Hill. You might have heard of it. It's a big school. Um, they, uh, this is the pharmacy school at UNC Chapel Hill. So you may be wondering, well, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not teaching freshmen, so I'm not going to do a flipped class. This is a pharmacy school, graduate professional school. They've actually done a flipped class in their pharmacy school. And so um, what they have uh, were able to see, and this is a really important bit of, um, I'm hoping this will open up here. So this is really interesting. They polled their students ahead of the flip and during class about the flip, and the students hated it at the beginning. 34% had positive things to say about the flip. At the end of the course, 89.5% students were positive about the flip. That tells me that, uh, well, it tells me a few things, but what, what it really tells me, and if you read the whole paper, you'll kind of glean this, is that there is a learning curve for all of us. There's a learning curve for the students, and there's a learning curve for us for the faculty who are doing these new things. Give yourselves a break. Ask your students how things are going, what you could do better, what can change, how, you know, you know, formatively assess yourself. Uh, and, and what we find is that students, you know, they come into this and they're like, oh, this is a flip class. Oh, I, I hate flip classes. A, they may not know what a flip class is. And B, they may not have had a good experience with a flipped class. And it may have not even been the flip component that they didn't like about that class. So I would, I would caution you in, in hearing students say, I hate a flipped class, and just saying, well, I'm never going to do a flipped class then. Um, it's all, everything's in the execution, right? So um, I'd be happy to talk with you offline about, you know, your specific plans because um, I know we're trying to accommodate everybody here. Um, and I want to open this last 10 minutes to kind of a, a address some individual concerns if we can. But if you would like for me to, to sit down with you on Zoom or, you know, six feet across the table, um, and we can talk specifically about how you can integrate a flipped classroom in your class, I'm happy to do that. Unfortunately, 
doing creating a flip class in a one hour conversation is is not practical um, but but I'm gonna go ahead and open it up here I'm gonna stop sharing my screen hopefully I have fairly convinced you that a flip class is at least worth considering but let's let's jump in here and ask uh, some specific questions so I'm opening the floor yeah, I have a quick question, and that is, um, so if I if I were switching to flipped, right? So now I have, let's say, I have like the fifty minute Monday, Wednesday, Friday type class, and now I'm sending them videos to watch that are, you know, probably somewhere on the same amount of time that I would spend in class because you know it's just how it's going to be. Um, how much, like, do I tell them? Well, we're just not going to meet on Wednesdays to kind of compensate for for like the time requirement that they have no you you want to meet with them um so remember what's what's different about the flip is that so that do your students typically let's say we have a traditional classroom and you are assigning them homework they've got to do that homework at, at home right and that may take them anywhere from an hour to three or four hours right and then you still expect them to come to class and watch the lectures right? All we're doing is the same amount of time spent in for your course is happening. We're just switching that. So the amount of time that they would be spending in lecture is being spent in class and the normal and the amount of time that they would be spending on homework is spent watching lecture videos. Does that make sense? So there's, there's no, you know, no reason to compensate for the amount of time they're spending watching the videos or anything like that. You're just taking the exact same course and flipping the delivery. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like basically I would have like all, all assigned homeworks, projects, whatever would all be in class time. And uh, okay. Absolutely. And, and the real value of that is I don't, you know, I, everybody on this call is probably way better of a student than I was. Um, but w when I would go home and sit down and do homework, because you know, I was that kid that sat in the back of the class and said, ah, I'll just do that at home. I got it. It's no big deal. And then I'd get home and I'd sit down to do it and I'd go, Ooh, I don't know how to do this. And then what happens is, is that you set it aside. Well, I'll figure it out later. Well, later comes like 24 hours before your test. And so the beauty of the flip class is that I have to wrestle with this in class right now. And you're standing there watching me either play on my phone or you're watching me wrestle with the material that you've just assigned me. And you can come up and say, hey, Ken, I noticed you're goofing around on your phone and not doing the problem. How's it going with the problem? Let's put our phones down and let's, let's get to work on the problem. Or you can say, what did you get for number three? Or you can say, what step are you on on number five? And that opens up a conversation. It's forcing me to apply the material because application is usually where the breakdown happens. Other questions? I have a question. Must it only be videos? Can you uh, provide like a chapter, like what I've done in the past, you give them a chapter to read and then answer some questions and then submit them online. I've used, uh, not uh, um, Blackboard, I've used Canvas in the past and they take the, answer the questions online, then you grade them. And if we go to class, you know where they like, do not understand the full lecture. Must it be a video you can basically just assign a chapter for them to read and then answer some questions and then submit them online and integrate them before you go to class? You, it's your class. You can do whatever you want. You can absolutely do that. What, what I'm recommending with the flipped class is trying to innovate a little bit away from a more traditional model of having an expectation that students will actually read the material ahead of class. Would we love it if they're doing that? Yes, we would. But we know from a lot of research that A, they're not doing it, and B, they don't necessarily know how to read the material. They're, they're, you know, I don't know if you've ever looked at a student's textbook, and you know, students love these things, right? They love to highlight things. And if you look at a student's textbook, you see this, the whole page is blue, right? That's not highlighting, that's, that's, you just changed the color of the text. So, because the students have a really difficult time understanding what is important. And so that's really where formative assessment can help as well, is that they start to learn before their 30% exam, what is important. 
And so students have a really hard time identifying what is important to read. So yeah, you can absolutely assign them some reading ahead of time, but that's what we've been doing for a thousand years is assigning students to read something ahead of time and asking them to be prepared when they come to class so that we can solve some problems. So I, I encourage you to continue to try that. I'm just offering uh, a, another way. Jen, may I ask something? Please, Valia, how are you? Fine, thank you, nice to see you again. So um, when we should make the videos available in the flip class? How, how long in advance? You know, let's say that we have Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So it's like the day before, like yeah. two days before, the week before, so. Right. That's a fantastic question. And I know that we're at August 14th. We're officially 10 days out, right? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to freak everybody out. Um, so when to offer, a lot of that has to do with how you structure your syllabus and how you structure your course. So if the expectation is, is that they are going to be able to perform well on a formative assessment on Wednesday, then they absolutely need to have access to that material no later than Monday, right? But I realize that we're building this in real time, right? You're probably building your class right now and you will probably continue to build your class over the course of the semester. Everybody understands that. And, and let me, let me back up briefly and bring up something that, that's uh, uh, near and dear to our hearts. In fact, we have one of the authors on our, uh, um, on our panel here, um, something called TILT, Transparency and Learning and Teaching. And if you are honest with them and you explain up front and you establish a rapport with your students and say, look, I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to give it to you as quickly as I can. If you're building a classroom community and a rapport with your students, they're, they're going to be on your team. They're, they're going to be willing to help you with that process. They will be patient. Um, and so um, be as transparent, not only in, in when, you know, in your policies and when your, your uh, videos will be uploaded, but be transparent into what you're trying to get from them by presenting this material, presenting this quiz. So here's the reason why I'm giving you these quizzes, guys, after you watch the videos. It's because I want you watching the videos, right? They don't need, you know, it doesn't need to be a secret that, that they're getting a quiz after the video. Tell them why they're getting a video or why they're getting a quiz. It's, we want them to watch the videos. So I would say get them uploaded as quickly or as soon as you can. But if you, if you need a little grace period to get them uploaded, then know that grace works both ways, right? So if you need a little bit of grace to get something uploaded, then you might offer them a little bit of grace to get their quiz submitted or to get their content watched, is, if that makes sense. So obviously now is better, right? I could say, no, Bali, you should have them all uploaded now, but I'm realistic. I know that you need to build this and you need to have them captioned and there's a process, right? So does that, does that help a little bit? Awesome. All right, so we have a couple of minutes for, for a couple more questions. Again, I want to be respectful of your time. And can I ask something else? Valia, come on. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> the person with the questions. Okay, so should every week look the same as the next one? So let's say that I teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I upload the videos in advance for Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then I have one third of the class on Monday. We discussed this yesterday on the one-to-one -one consultation, but let me get this again. So Monday, I will have one third of the class in person to solve problems or discussion or whatever. Then the other group for the same problems, the same discussion on Wednesday and so on. But should I keep the same schedule throughout the semester? Or I can be flexible with notice, of course, in advance or in the syllabus that this week we'll have, I don't know, discussion, group A, B, C, whatever all three days of the week, but next week we are not going to do this. Or, okay. you know what I mean? Or, sure. So, okay. so structure and consistency are very important. Um, so uh, let me, so you, you all may be aware that uh, Texas Tech is a Hispanic serving institution, right? And so um, we know that consistency is very important for all students. We know that uh, structure is important for all students. But we also know that 30% of our classes may be made up of students that are in an underrepresented group, right? We know from the literature that all students benefit from structure 
but underrepresented minority students disproportionately benefit from structure. In fact, they, they benefit more. And so um, I strongly recommend that you, 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 you make a plan and you make that plan consistent week by week by week because there's nothing worse, and I think we can all uh, relate to this, there's nothing worse than a moving target. When you're trying to figure out what, what the expectation is, right? So obviously if, if there's some flex, because you're gonna ask for some flex from them, they're gonna ask for some flex for you, from you. But by and large, as, as much structure and consistency that you can have, the better. May I inter interject? Please. So this, um, so, well, two things. So what I'm teaching Cal something, Cal one maybe. Um, <laughs> in the fall, I taught Cal two online several times. It's the first time I've taught Cal one um, in this way. So, I recorded the videos. I'll be the first to say that my lectures, they are three minutes is not gonna happen. They're like 40 minutes. So I took the mindset, this is what you're going to do. This is class, but they're nice voiceovers. They're jokes, you know, whatever. So I've tried to make the video um, as engaging as possible, but I also use the same for my PowerPoint slides and the videos. So they have that. So I tried to give them a different way to use the same material, if that makes sense, right? So they already have the PowerPoint slides in advance so they can look at those and now you have these videos to go along with it. Um, so my philosophy is to, when I first did my first online class, I struggled because I was like, or oh, this kind of modality, because when you're teaching face-to-face, -face, you can move, right? Um, I learned Anita Nunez was the person that helped me at the time. And she said, it's better that if you set up the class this same way, even as a face-to-face -face class, so even my face-to-face -face classes are honestly set up like online classes. It takes me a long time to plan the whole semester at once. Can you move? But then I plan them all at one time. I create this calendar, like you do this same thing. So they have this level of expectations. The students know on Mondays this is gonna happen on you know, it's it takes a lot of time, like the summertime to think about how this is gonna look. But when at least it's helped my students when they come in, they know I can plan, and I teach honor students a lot, so you gotta think about their little OCD sometimes, and I'm one of those people too. So they can plan their whole semester right then, and then they know, okay, this is what she's expected of me, this is what the course, you know, what's expected of the course. And I'm also more of one of, I don't know what the word is, but take your initiative in your own learning, so I'm gonna put it out here, what are you willing to give? So with the videos being posted in advance, I won't necessarily say it's gonna double the amount of work. I'm gonna do the same thing in class, but we're gonna do a lot of problems. So I think about students, freshmen, if you can walk away with, in a week, 50 worked problems that you may not have done yourself, then I think they will think that that's an advantage as compared to sitting in class, making, watching me having, or going through lecture and then not having as many problems worked. Because, and I honestly don't think they're gonna watch the videos, right? And I think they're gonna say, okay, they're gonna cut to the parts. Okay, this is where she works this. They're gonna make their own three to five minute snippets. I think that's what they're gonna do. They're yep. gonna cut to, this is where she worked the example. This is where she worked the example. This is where she worked the example. And then the content or the, the content knowledge of the material, the students that have watched all the videos, those are students that are gonna excel in those thinking kind of problems. Because I really think about the students they can just go to Khan Academy, right? Or somebody else and watch a five minute snippet and say, this is how you do this. So what's the difference in what I'm providing? And there's more of this content knowledge that you're gonna to have to be able to understand. So I kind of wanna write my exams where if you watch the videos, well, let's say if you just know how to do problems, you're gonna get C's because that's what expected of you. And then if you've got some content knowledge, you can get a B. If you have greater content knowledge, you can get an A. And I'm gonna explain that to them in that way so they're invested in watching my videos. And I'll tell them, why would you go watch a Khan Academy video? I'm not gonna assess you on the content of a Khan Academy video. I'm gonna assess you on the content of my video. So take the time to watch it. So I don't necessarily think it's doubling the work. It's making them take ownership in their learning. And then we can practice more in class. As Ken is saying, I can go next to you. I'm a big fan of group work. I don't like to be lectured to, honestly. I'm like, let's work some problems. Let's just... So I want to do that with them, and I'm hoping that that will help them get on board. But I have to set up my, so my face-to-face -face classes or online classes, they look the same. I have the same template 
like the same everything for every single class that I teach. It's just copy and paste. You move it, you move it, you move it. The format is the same. So it's consistency for me, but it also helps the students know, you know, what to do. Like one trick that I learned is never write any dates on anything, right? So my syllabus only says fall 2020. That's the only date that's on it. Everything else says refer to Blackboard for the course date. So then I'm not having to go repeat. I only have to change one thing at a time. So I'm just changing the course schedule. That's the only thing, especially classes that I've taught multiple times, the course schedule is the only thing that changes. I don't have to go back and change the syllabus, make all this new stuff every time. Like it's, I had to learn that the hard way from Anita because we're used to writing dates everywhere. She's like, but if you taught this class five times, has material changed? Oh, look, you have a buddy. Has the material changed? No, the material hasn't changed. So why are you changing the dates on everything? So I'm trying to take that online thing and bring it to my face-to-face -face class. And so far, it's helped me. And honestly, doing that, I started teaching online in like 2014. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Why am I doing this? This is just pointless. And then when we had to, we had to go online because of COVID, my transition was smooth because I had been practicing that the whole time. So I think this is going to help us long term, not just right now. I think it'll just it'll be a whole lot better. That we'll be more flexible in what we need to do. Yeah, that's an excellent point that we didn't spend much time on. Uh, that if and when we transition to a full distance modality um, with with all this COVID business, you'll be ready. So I told you I I teach a distance class and have for six years. In in March of 2020 when everybody was running around with their hair on fire, freaking out because they had to figure out how to start teaching their face-to-face -face class online. I was like, I'm good. I'm already, I'm already set. My class doesn't change at all. So that's another major benefit. I appreciate you bringing that up, Reagan. So yeah, um, a, a pro tip on, on what Reagan mentioned, try to avoid all sorts of temporal statements in your recorded videos like good afternoon, good morning. They may not be watching it in the morning. They may not be watching the afternoon. Don't say things like, hey, what did you think of the Super Bowl? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, I know that we want to build rapport, but try to avoid statements like that um, because that, that will allow you to recycle it for years and years and years, right? Unless your science has changed or data has changed, you know, if, if those things are happening, then I encourage you to, you know, to update uh, or if you've gotten a new hairdo. <laughs> So um, I want to go ahead and wrap us up just again to be responsible uh, or, or, or uh, uh, sensitive to everyone's time. That PDF file that you sent that you show with the FLIP. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I will. I will send that. Um, okay. Put the link. I don't know if is it a specific. Yeah, actually, let me let me get to that as a link. Okay, and then I'll. Um, if, uh, actually, I think I can put a file in. Let me do that. Because I don't have it as I have it as a file. I don't have it as a link. Everyone, I'll knows. ask one more question. So, on yeah, please. While I'm doing I this, want to say, like you know, you have all your standard things. So I just want to put this blurb to say, this semester we're going to attempt a flipped classroom and describe a flipped classroom to the students, just so they know, and then we'll talk about it more in advance. Is there anything more that I need to put on the syllabus? You know, in terms of policies and things of that nature? Right, because students are walking in with this expectation, right? And I would want to know what I'm getting into. So I just want to say, you know, we're going to attempt a, I don't know, course structure. We're going to attempt a flip classroom. This is what a flip classroom is. And this may require you, thank you, this may require you to do these other kinds of things. And then beyond that, that's all I really want to say. I don't want to I mean, I guess I could put in an introductory email. I don't know if this, if it has to be on the syllabus, but I want to give them, I just want them to have that information. Yeah, if, if you've not already started to receive emails from students, you will start to receive emails from students wanting to know how the class is gonna be delivered. Um, I'm starting to get those, I know Valia is. Um, and so it might not be a bad idea to go ahead and make that public knowledge that, that you're gonna be doing a flipped class. And, and then it might be worth briefly defining what that means. Um, so they, you know, cause just like us, we're trying to figure out synchronous, asynchronous, hybrid, flipped, all that stuff. They're, they're not pedagogists. They're trying to figure all that stuff out too. So yeah, I would, I would err on the side of more information. All right, y'all. It's been so lovely seeing you and talking to you and hearing from you. Um, if, 
please don't hesitate. My, my, I love my job because I get to help y'all. Um, and shoot me an email if you're confused about something or you would like to see some more data on any of this, uh, or you just need some help in getting it set up, or if you're, you forgot an email that I, that I mentioned in class or in class on this session, uh, just let me know. Okay. Um, so nice to see you all. And I hope to see you in our future sessions. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks y'all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much.